Good afternoon to you. I am Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com here. It is Monday, the 27th day of March 2023. And on today's docket, we're going to talk about what to look for regarding the upcoming hurricane season, a few key things that I'm going to be watching. But before we get into that, I just want to say thank you to making last week's video, the El Nino video, so big. Uh, almost 100,000 views so far and for our channel. That is wonderful. So thanks to all of you that are trusting me for information the several hundred subscribers that I have picked up our channel we all appreciate that the back-end team all of us it really does matter and the comments yes there are a lot more comments that come with that some of them I'm a little like what's going on here but the rest hey I appreciate it very much that you trust me enough to give these videos a listen and if you're brand new to this channel there's a lot more where that came from and uh, we have a lot planned as we always do heading into the hurricane season. All right, now that's a good way to jump in to today's topic. Hurricane season, it's coming. So what do we watch for? Last week we talked about El Nino, and that's going to have a lot to do with what happens this hurricane season. First of all, the SOI, I like to look at this as a way to understand the pressure patterns across the tropical Pacific. Over the last 30 days, we're hovering right around zero. Remember, this is just an index, like the U.S. Stock Exchange, for example. It's not a measurement of something like 102 degrees is a temperature. This is just an index, okay? It's just an average of numbers, etc. And we can see that the last 30 days are right around neutral or zero. The 90 day SOI number, the Southern Oscillation Index number, is still a pretty healthy eight, positive eight there. And today's contributor is 0.14. Why? Why is that? Well, it's the difference here between Tahiti and Darwin, the pressure differences there. And it's all through a mathematical calculation. You can go read about it on Wikipedia or Google or something if you want to. But what I like to see is the end result. What's the bottom line here? And the bottom line, the SOI has been gradually declining, meaning that the general pressure pattern is changing and that the equatorial Pacific trade winds are kind of different right now. And we're getting more westerly winds from time to time. And that is helping to foster the growth towards this warm ENSO event or El Nino, all right? And we can see that manifesting itself here on the global map here, the NOAA Coral Reef Watch Anomalies map. Now this is from March 26th, it's always a day behind 2023. Remember that, because I'm gonna show you something in just a few minutes here that's, I mean, it might blow your mind a little bit. It's pretty remarkable when we go and look at the past. But let's look at what we've got right now. There's the growing El Nino in the Eastern Pacific. It's east weighted right now in the Nino 1, 2, and 3 areas. Those are just the way that it's geographically divided. Farther to the west in the Nino 3, 4 region and out into the 3 area, the Nino 3 area, basically out through this area, right through here. Yeah, still warming up to the east side, but still cool to cool neutral in the middle, in the middle of the Pacific. And we've got this area off the uh, west coast of the U.S., the cold PDO or Pacific Decadal Oscillation Signature very cold water relative to average. These are anomalies, departures from the average. Pretty cold in the eastern Pacific there, almost looks like a little bit of a horseshoe, right? Notice though in the Atlantic, we have a warm horseshoe shape in the Atlantic, extending from the North Atlantic off the Iberian Peninsula over here, down into the deep tropics. That is a sign overall of a fairly healthy signal to give you a robust hurricane season if it were not for the oncoming El Nino. So the question is, and this is one of the keys to watch for in terms of how this upcoming hurricane season behaves, do we get a, a solid bona fide El Nino developing across the equatorial Pacific where you basically fill all of this in with oranges and reds through here and it's all the way across and then you also start to warm up the areas in the Eastern Pacific just off of North America where that PDO also flips to above average. And if that happens and you don't even change the Atlantic over here, this stays warmer than average, we will probably see a down year in terms of the numbers. The numbers, that's what we're talking about. The forecast numbers. How many named storms? How many hurricanes? How many major hurricanes? And what is the energy output? That's the ACE score. Those numbers are likely going to be lower than we have seen over the last 10 years or so, roughly. All right, now last year was pretty low because of a whole bunch of other factors, even though it was predicted early on. That's the catch here. 
Remember last year around this time, especially once we got into April and May and early June, we thought the 2022 hurricane season could be historic. It turned out to be historic for other reasons, Fiona and Ian among those, but ace count, name storms, all that kind of stuff, no, we fell far short. So that's something to keep in mind. Even though something looks like it should happen, it doesn't mean that it has to happen. All right, so even though we might have an El Nino coming on, that doesn't mean that the Atlantic hurricane season is automatically canceled. So we'll be watching this. How does this evolve over time? Right through here, especially, this, does this fill in and warm up, spreading westward across the equatorial regions of the Pacific? And how does the Atlantic Basin behave? Does this start to cool off some? We'll have to wait and see. There's different models and different thoughts on this. But let me show you what it looked like the last time we had a big El Nino. This is 2015, all right? The last big El Nino. Look at the differences here. This is 2015, this is now. The Atlantic is way warmer. It's the complete opposite of what we saw in 2015. We had a cold horseshoe over in the eastern Atlantic and a very warm horseshoe uh, over in the eastern Pacific there in, in the subtropical regions and in the North Pacific. The El Nino was already well on its way. It was already spreading across the tropical Pacific back in 2015. So you could make the argument, and of course 2015 ended up being, I don't know if they called it a super El Nino, all these different words and titles, but it was a very solid, strong El Nino in 2015, no doubt about it. It led to, among other things, the deaths of a bunch of sea lions and other marine life, even as far north as California. I have a friend that works over at the Georgia Aquarium in Atlanta, and he has talked to me extensively about that. You have a lot of effects that happen because this is like a giant radiator or an air conditioner if you get a La Nina where you start to drop those Pacific temperatures. Well, we've had a La Nina for the last three years. Now we're heading into this El Nino, but will it look like this? Of course, this is what it looked like back then on this date, uh, late March 2015. And as you can see, we were well ahead of where we are now. So I tend to think at least from that perspective, as we get into the beginning of the Atlantic hurricane season through probably August, we're not going to see anything related to this because it's going to take a lot to cool all of this off where we are right now. Let's drop me out of the frame for a second. See, I mean, look, it's already very warm in the eastern Atlantic. We've got a long way to go if we're going to chisel all that warmth away and then heat up the eastern Pacific. And I just don't see that happening you know, what mechanism would dr would drive that? It's kind of late in the season uh, or the year, you know, as we progress towards hurricane season for that to really be happening. Another clue to all of this, and this is a big one, the subsurface warmth. Now, if you're not sure what you're looking at here, this can be a little bit overwhelming. So let me try to help out. This is the surface right up here, the, up at the top, all right? And this is 450 meters deep. This is like if you took a slice through various methods of deep water temperature sensors and other ways that they measure these things. This is your temperature profile through a slice of the Pacific Ocean, roughly along the equatorial region. Where geographically? This is the uh, far eastern Pacific over in the right-hand corner. Let's clear all that out so you can see it better. So that's about, what does that say, 90 or 80 west, something like that, and it goes all the way over to 120 east or so. So it's a vast area of the Pacific, a little slice right through it, and it's a temperature profile. So at the surface here is uh, your cold water pool that I showed you over on the other map. So let's just see how this correlates. This is your below average area, not much of it left, and that translates to, drop me out again, this area right through here at the surface. You understand? So if you go and slice through it like we're showing, then this is what you get. So here's your cold water or your cold anomalies that's left. And then your very warm anomaly is just below the surface and up to the surface. This is the Eastern Pacific over here. We'll try to draw an E in here. That's terrible, isn't it? And this is the West Pack over here, all right? Way down below, several hundred meters deep or so, the water temperatures are way warmer than they should be on the order of four to five degrees Celsius. That is a vast pool of warm water below the surface. How do you get that to come to the surface? That's where you need those westerly winds, okay? Remember, this is the west over here. Let's see if I can do a better E. And this is the east over on this side. You need some consistent westerly winds to blow across, to 
create what we call these Kelvin waves where you can drive this warm water eastward. South America is right there and it can't go through South America so it upwells over here just through the natural progression of things and it surfaces as they say and it spreads out across the Pacific and you get the growth of the El Nino. So we're going to watch this closely as well. How much does that warm water make advances and is there any other upwelling of colder water that comes along? Now one of the things that can sort of halt this or slow it down are those trade winds. And this Hovmuller diagram shows the westerly wind burst right there and that's that area between 60 west and 120 west. This is right there in the eastern Pacific. When was it? Early March through just a couple of weeks ago. That is the indication of strong westerly winds at about 5,000 feet. We've also had westerly winds, generally speaking, or slower trade winds is another way to look at it, in the Atlantic, 60 west and points east. When? From about mid-March until just recently. In fact, it's still going on. A slowing of the trades. But look at these blues through here, especially from the where we are now out into early April. And that's an increase in the, uh, the trade winds there. The blues are anomalous easterlies, or an easterly, we won't call it a wind burst. Uh, you got to get a little bit more strength in there than what we're seeing here on the legend. But these are pretty solid easterlies where they are happening all across those INSA regions there. So let's go 120, and that's about halfway. We'll call that about 80 or so, maybe 90. Where is that on longitude scale? Let's show you. Let's go back to the map. These easterlies should start coming in right around here all the way across to the dateline, 180 degrees west longitude. Strong yeah, to brisk easterlies all through here. That's what this Hovmuller forecast is showing. This is over from uh, Dr. Michael Ventress website. And um, yeah, we've had some easterlies start and they're going to pick up here and persist when, that's the key here, from late March where we are now through the first few days of April. There are other models that go further out into time, but this is a nice one from Dr. Ventress website. And uh, I just think that's interesting that these easterly winds here, let's just put it this way, they're not westerly. They're not helping the El Nino keep on going. You got to keep those westerly winds going to get that big old area of warm subsurface water to come east. It's like this massive area of subsurface warmth that's got to have something that pushes it. And those easterly winds that we're seeing showing up here gradually moving more east with time. Remember these are your longitude lines down here. That is very interesting to see and if we slow down the progression of El Nino and it's just weak overall and the Atlantic stays as warm as it is, we could have a fairly active hurricane season coming up. So that's something else to watch. Another key to this is how these anomalies play out, all right? The uh, wind anomalies. And part of that, and it's interesting how everything's connected, is the Madden-Julian oscillation. Now, the MJO is basically this 30-day period in the tropics when you get either sinking air or rising air, more westerly winds, or when there's not an MJO passage, more easterly winds, that kind of thing. And it's a little bit more complicated than that. But the Madden-Julian oscillation is an, an important driver of tropical convection, that's thunderstorm activity, and the wind patterns. Look what happened, past tense here, recently. That incredible amplification of the MJO way out into those phases there, uh, went through 7, 8, and 1, really amplified the westerly wind flow across the tropical Pacific. That's seen in the past there. That's what this shows here, the past. This is where we are now. It's headed into the null phase, which means no appreciable MJO activity anywhere. And then this is the ECMWF, the ensemble plots there. Let's try to simplify this more. Looks like angel hair pasta, right? Generally speaking, probably going to amplify again, heading back around uh, into the Western Pacific. Now the question is, does it really go gangbusters again? and give us a strong westerly wind burst again as we get into April. This would be a couple of weeks out or so. We'll just have to wait and see, and we can look at this every week. In fact, they're available daily over at the Climate Prediction Center website. So the MJO will be a big driver. Does it help the El Nino? Does it stall? And that's one thing to watch. Does it come out 
and then just kind of dive back into the null phase and just kind of dance around like this? Or do we get repeating patterns similar to what we saw in March really driving the forces there that get that El Nino to lock in and stay locked in through hurricane season? We'll just have to see, right? Absolutely. All right, so those were, um, and we're still on anomalies. These are anomalies. Let's look closer to home. Another factor that could impact the hurricane season, obviously water temperatures are not everything. That is the first major ingredient. If you have cold water, basically under 80 degrees Fahrenheit under most conditions, there are some situations where you can have 78 degree water, 74 degree water Fahrenheit, and you can still get a tropical cyclone to develop because of very cold air in the upper atmosphere and way, way more instability. But those are rare events. Let's just look at it from a typical perspective, 80 degrees and higher, or around 26 Celsius. Well, the Gulf of Mexico is well above that right now in terms of the anomalies. It is war running warmer than average everywhere for the most part. And a good chunk of the Gulf of Mexico right through here, roughly, is at that 26 Celsius line and higher, or that, that mark, right, um, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. These are the anomalies, all right? These are departures from average. Much of it the, uh, the Western Atlantic and the Gulf running above average. You can also see that El Nino trying to develop here off the coast of South America. There's the Galapagos Islands, and it's starting to spread its influence off to the west a little bit. This will create some tropical convection from time to time, upward motion. You get the shear from that over the Caribbean because when the winds go up in the convection, they spread out in the, um, uh, towards the stratosphere and uh, at about the 200 millibar level below the stratosphere, but you get wind shear because of that. So we'll watch all this, but really the warm gulf here is concerning because it's been this way, I think, and I talked about this last week, for like 10 years or so, and it's given us these incredibly intense hurricanes that we have seen. Laura, you know, Harvey rapidly intensifying, Michael 2018, last year with Ian. Ian is the thumbnail cover shot for today. In case you're wondering, that was Ian, as it was just about to leave Cuba, right over here. That was Ian. So yeah, the Gulf plays a big role, but I want to caution you, and I know a lot of you already know this, the Gulf is always going to be warm enough until something drastic changes in the climate for intense hurricanes. I'm curious to see how warm it is early, because before we start really building this El Nino, and all of these changes that will make the Atlantic hostile, if it's happening, if the Gulf is warm early, you get these what are called Central American gyres, where you get this setup down here of anomalous westerly wind flow coming out of the eastern Pacific. Your trades come in from the uh, Caribbean and Atlantic. And you get this counterclockwise gyre down here, and you sometimes pinch off vorticity or energy, and they turn into storms that come up into the Gulf of Mexico. And sometimes they head over to Texas, and maybe even the Florida Big Bend. That is usually early in the season. We start seeing these show up as phantoms on the GFS especially. It gets kind of crazy and uh, latches onto that heat and energy and it spins up these storms from time to time. A warm Gulf early and a warm Caribbean, it's always warm down there. That's why people vacation there, right? Um, would help that to manifest itself maybe a little bit earlier. So you could have some intense June hurricane activity if the pattern fits. And one of the ingredients does look like it'll be there, and that is the warm Gulf of Mexico. So these are the anomalies, and these are the actuals. This is your 26 Celsius line right here. So yes, a good chunk of the Gulf already warmer, uh, warm enough to support hurricane activity, and warmer than average overall. And this is, again, the end of March. and another month, pretty much the whole Gulf will be warm enough and then once we get to May, mid-May on, and we're not that far away really, just six weeks or so, we're going to really have to start to watch and see, do we get one of these CAG events down here, these Central American gyres that could spin off a piece of energy, like I said, and it makes its way into the Gulf, and then you just have to wait and see what happens. The other thing, real quick, this very warm Gulf does impact the severe weather down here. To what extent, I can't give you direct proof. I am not a severe weather expert, so to speak, but logic would dictate that the above normal water temperatures, higher dew points, higher moisture content, all of that energy, and the warm water vapor is energy, gets funneled into the deep south here from 
this strong Atlantic ridge out here, big old high pressure. The return flow around it pumps that moisture into the deep south. These fronts come through, and you get that ignition zone through here, and that's where those very violent and destructive and tragic tornadoes took place. That is probably going to continue, and we'll talk about that a little bit at the end here with a look at the Storm Prediction Center. So the Gulf has more to do than just with hurricanes, all right? So there it is. There's the warmth in the Gulf warming up as we progress, as you would expect. And it's springtime. It's supposed to. All right, the Atlantic, just in case you're wondering, mid-Atlantic states and elsewhere, cold up here as it should be, but warmer than average overall. Same thing down south and west. Gulf Stream running through here. It's warmer than it should be. Really haven't had a lot of uh, significant Atlantic hurricane activity over the last several years. A few here and there, Isaias. Um, we had Henri up in the northeast recently. Uh, what was that, 21, 2021? Um, so, you know, we haven't had to worry about it too much. This is always going to be, uh, uh, as I say, a crapshoot because you get these hurricanes that turn the corner around the Bermuda High. You remember last year we were a little bit worried about what would Fiona do. Fiona ended up over in Nova Scotia, of course. Uh, but the bottom line, water temperatures on their way up. They are anomalously warmer than they should be off the East Coast. We've seen that for the last several years. We've just been fortunate in one regard that the intense hurricanes have stayed to the south. Not good for people down south, but no, as you are well aware, we have not had these very powerful hurricanes running up the East Coast. When will that luck run out? Hey, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. I don't want it to happen as I live right here. You call me selfish, but... I'll just do without a big hurricane, thank you very much. They are not pleasant, even though they are really exciting to track. Yes, they are not pleasant to deal with in person. All right, so let's just look at this real quick, Storm Prediction Center. Uh, as we talk about severe weather, slight risk today down in the southeast. Uh, general thunderstorm activity out in parts of the plains. Not much to really worry about today like we've had the last few days. You could get you know some tornado risk down here, 2%. That's not zero. And then there's also the 2% tornado risk in parts of the upper Texas coast. So just keep that in mind. Moving out to tomorrow, we start to calm things down just a little bit. But then by day three, what will be the makings? Look out west. There's California. Another storm coming in off the Pacific. Just a few random thunderstorms here and there in parts of uh, Texas along the Rio Grande Valley and in southeast Florida. But when we get out to days four through eight, let's just specifically look at four. 15% chance here. Not real concerned about this just yet. I'm trying to draw on it. Come on now. Um, more of a isolated to scattered variety, but it's Friday. This is Thursday. Friday, this could be significant. And uh, we're going to have to really focus on this. I'll probably do another video coming up in um, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday time frame to outlook this even more and outline what's happening and just keep you aware. Um, that could be a really big event. Uh, the return moisture, the return flow, where? From the Gulf of Mexico. Absolutely coming right up into that. Storm system coming through. You got the front cutting in. The ingredient's going to be there for potentially a big severe weather day. I think they call that parts of the Corn Belt or something like that. Um, but the, uh, the Ohio uh, River Valley, parts of the Mississippi River Valley, pay attention to this. We get into April, at the end of March here into April, severe weather will be on the uptick as it progresses towards deeper into spring. All right? All right. Again, I want to thank all the new people. I mean, seriously, 100,000 views probably by this afternoon of last week's video. It is. It's great. It's nice to see that my work is appreciated. Yes, these videos can be lengthy, but I try to give you what I look at. Even without you guys out there in YouTube world and social media world, this is what I would look at regardless. The fact that I do have this audience, and it is growing. It's been steadily growing ever since I got on YouTube all the way back in 2006. Um, it's a great thing. It's nice to be able to share my passion, my knowledge. I mean, I've been doing this for about 30 years, so hopefully I've learned something along the way, and I like to sort of spill that over and help you out as well. All right? I don't know everything, and that's why we have comments, and that's why I lean on other experts, and you'll see that a lot in my videos that I will show different people on Twitter that I follow. And every once in a while, we even have a guest come on, and we expand upon a certain topic or whatever, we call that our Hurricane U series, like Hurricane University. Um, just a lot of good stuff that we do here, all right? All right, so don't forget, as they say, subscribe, like, and share, especially if you want to know when we're going live, when we cover live severe weather or hurricane activity 
and when I post any new video content, that's the way to do it. All right, that'll do it for me for this week. As always, thank you for tuning in. I do appreciate it, especially all the new folks. Good to have you along. Lots more where this came from. We'll see you next time. I am Mark Seth of Hurricane Track. That's our channel. I'll talk to you again probably later in the week.